Hi, everyone, and welcome to Brave Conversations. Uh, this is a, a conversation where we will reveal stories and inspirations from people, like right? real people doing real things to create real change. And today we have with us Yanan Piskin, who has uh, 25 years of experience as a successful expat herself, leading multicultural teams to work together and create value to the organization. She now coaches foreign women leaders who have moved to the UK and is trying to assimilate with the local corporate culture. And she helps them also adjust to the changes in work and life as an expat and coaches them to get ahead in their careers. She is a Marshall Goldsmith Stakeholder uh, Centered Coaching uh, Certified Coach and has worked with both entrepreneurs as well as C-level executives. Yanan is happily married with two kids and she loves ballet, visual arts, and boxing. Okay, so and <laughs> she's also a very passionate contributor to the community. So Yanan, thank you for being with us today. Um, and you know, we look forward to learning more from you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for this nice presentation. And I'm really happy to be with you today. Uh, just having a nice conversation with you. Excellent. So tell us about, you know, um, what inspired you to help women leaders? Um, why women leaders and why foreign talent specifically? Uh, in this, indeed, uh, this is something I have already went through these uh, phases as a woman and also in the corporate life uh, and who has moved to three different countries in the last five years time, able to share my experiences, my failures, my learnings, and what I have enjoyed throughout my uh, professional life would be utmost importance to share with the people who are in the same circumstances. So you you wandered around and become expats in different places and you're a woman as well. You've got two kids. Um, what were the challenges you were facing? Um, this is for me and also valid for quite a lot of expats, uh, not, uh, not necessarily be women, uh, but the first one could be the language. The language is, uh, it's not about speaking English or whatever the pro uh, business language is there, but the um, conversational English, they would be leading their lives in their, in their corporate, uh, new corporate world, let's say, when you are meeting uh, with them and when you are speaking up your ideas and having kind of a, a support circle with you. Secondly, uh, relocating to different countries and the bureaucracy you are dealing with, registration things, the school, uh, finding schools and having a driving license. Over and above, <laughs> you are in a new working environment. Plus, the well-being of the family because you are the person who is leading the family to move from one place to another. You feel the responsibility of the well-being of the whole family plus yourself. So these are the main challenges I have uh, went through, especially in the first six months time. What was that like for you and how did you overcome that? A planning ahead of the time. Uh, for example, when, when I was uh, planning to go to another role in another country, I was creating a cash flow uh, in an Excel file, how the living costs of life would be there. Plus, uh, I was enrolling to renting websites to find out good places that I can live and continue my living standards, checking where the schools are, how far the school is to my house, and also checking if there are um, social activities I can be part of, like yoga classes, dance classes, uh, and get into the local community. Additionally, uh, in the working environment, I was getting introduced to my stakeholders. This would be helping rather than meeting them in a risk committee meeting. It's better that I introduce myself. I'm Jana Pishkin. I'm the new head of blah, blah department, and I'll be working with you. What are the challenges you had working with our department? Do you need any 
uh, support or we need any further collaboration that people will be getting used to me and familiar with my face, with the familiar with my working style, uh, so that I can be more comfortable in much serious occasions, let's say. And I was doing the same with my neighbors. I was knocking their, their door. I'm number 22, Jana Fishkin. I moved from Azerbaijan to UK. This is my phone number. If you need anything about the house or anything, just let me know. So just planning ahead of the time and also getting introduced with people. I think that's interesting because when you're introducing with uh, yourself to people, it seems like you're not asking them for help, but you're basically, you know, I'm Janan, and if you need my help, let me know, right? Um, and, and what were people's response to that? Because a lot of people are too afraid to do that, obviously, because they feel they're going to be made fun of or they're going to be ridiculed or something or rejected. What were, what were the responses that you got? It was always sincere, even in corporate life or in the personal life, it's always sincere and people are more happy. And, uh, you know, there is the epidemic of being lonely in the world, even in corporate life, even in our personal lives. And when people are living in the metropolitans, they are living in their luxury houses, having their own way of life very closed and we don't have any more our family connections that's other than the FaceTime we have and when there is someone a human being <laughs> knocking their door or asking for a catch-up and just meet up uh, in the corp life, corp life it's really valuable it's solid and this is something they are already longing for that's interesting because again, you're, you're saying this epidemic of loneliness, uh, not only for the expat that has come in, but also actually for people who may not even be expats. I mean, in corporate life, do you find that, uh, I mean, in corporate life, we have a, a team, a big team and everything like that. But what you're saying is people are actually lonely within the team. Indeed, indeed. Uh, there is a question, if I need help, people uh, will label me as she's just helpless she cannot uh, do it on her own or she's not capable to do anything uh, or she is a superpower she can do everything there is no in between and this is creating us quite a lot of stress and it turns into a burnout for all people right right and why do you decide to focus on women specifically I mean I would think that male expats would feel the same way why women uh, for example, one of the challenges I have mentioned, the being responsible for the well-being of the family would not be a challenge for a man, for the dad of the family. He would be just moving and that's it. And most of the things will be just sorted out. Probably the wife would be helping about the registration things and other stuff. But when it's the case for a woman, who is going abroad for the uh, as an expat for an expat role? The women will be prioritizing all the things at the same time <laughs> and leaving nothing for herself generally. Right. So that's why I found it more. This is what I went through as well. Exactly. Exactly. And what are what are some of the uh, um, the changes that you hope uh, to create with the women that you want to work with? Most importantly, the, the confidence in themselves. Once they have the sufficient confidence within themselves, they will be able to speak up in the meetings. Uh, they will be able to accomplish more than what is expected of them rather than just catching up what is the requirements of the corporate life reaching out uh, for help if they need. And not to think that it is not being about helplessness, but it is about having uh, more support, more infrastructure for them, and accomplish their best selves. Mm. You come from Turkey, is that correct? Yeah, I'm Turkish, indeed. And then you've been expatriated in UAE and different other places, but probably a more male-dominated 
business culture. Would you say that? It is, yes. Yeah. And what was it like being a female leader in such cultures? And how did you manage to have that confidence or have that impact, that success that you did? Probably it's coming from my personality or how I was grown up. I have an elder brother and I never thought that he is another gender and, and I'm another gender. Whatever he does, I would be able to accomplish. <laughs> oh, so that was the case for anything in the world. So if there is something that someone has done, it is possible. There is no a requirement to be a woman or man. So the gender has never been a criteria for me to do something. I always consider what I need to do or I need to have to be that person, that role, that um, or to be promoted to something. If it's education, I invested for it. I paid my MBA, for example. I did not wait for my company to sponsor it. If it's uh, self-development, I invested for it. I started working with a coach. Yeah, that's it. I was just out of my personal limitations. That's the only limitation you can have. That's amazing. And and for people who don't have that confidence, well, how do you help them reach that confidence? Because it seems like, you know, from an early age, you didn't really care about whether you're a man or a woman. And probably there's other things. There's that mindset. If it, can be, if it can be done by other people, I can do it as well. What about people who probably came from a different kind of background, perhaps when they were put down, bullied, and everything? How do you work with them to kind of give them that confidence back? Mm -hmm. You know, every human being has different experiences. And with these experiences, they create connections to make use of their in their lives it's harder to break those connections or those vi hard wirings than creating new ones i facilitate them to experience new ex new things new practices new ways of doing things that they that it becomes like a habit that their behavior can change. Our behaviors are based on what we have, our experience, the surrounding we are, where we are living, our identity, our culture, whatever. But once you're introducing new identities, new environment, new ways of doing things, you can create new experiences, new connections in your mind so that you can have a new uh, world for yourself. The human mind can only deal with seven concepts at the same time it's like you are the average of five people around you so if you decide what seven things you want to work on you will change your world there's the crowding up, crowding out effect if you introduce something new that will be um, helping you progress in your life eventually what is negative what is limiting what is a bad experience you had in your in your past will be fading away will not be dominant anymore and while you are um, repeating the new habits the new behaviors in your life they will become more dominant and that will change your world change your way of working change your perception by the other people Interesting, because I think it's people try to change their mindset without changing their behavior, and it's quite difficult, right? And it's sometimes when mind and body is one, sometimes you let the body go first, and then the mind will follow, right? Um, yeah, and it's interesting what you said. It's not about changing, you know, your weaknesses, but it's actually about creating new habits, you know? Sometimes deprogramming is harder than just creating new programs, and you wait until that new program becomes more of a habit. It's very interesting what you do. Um, what, okay, so you, I wanna go back to where you're from and then now you're in the UK. Um, what, what are the cultural shifts that you think uh, you made uh, moving to the UK? What, what is the difference and the adjustments that you have to make? First, as a lifestyle, I had to do everything on my own. <laughs> Yes, Previously in Turkey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, this is the land of DIYs. <laughs> True. Uh, indeed. And this also helped me to make my life simpler, to eliminate, eliminate the things that are not no more serving, just um, not doing the repetitive things that is not adding anything to me. And investing this time for my development, for my well-being. Not development means I don't I will be the uh, the Einstein, but it's about as long as I'm fine, my world will be fine. This is a lesson I have learned when my first child was going to nursery and the pedagogue. She, I was struggling, you know, the ba the new baby. She's going to school, but, uh, so I was full time working, and he said that. You have to prioritize yourself. Once you are fine with yourself, then you can prioritize either your husband or your child or your, or your pet or your business. It's up to you. And there is not a one fits for all ranking. In my previous culture, as, I, as you said, uh, you have to prioritize your children. Oh, you are a mother. You are always labeled for something. You are not labeled with yourself. Now in UK, uh, I came to realize that you are prioritizing yourself. And I see quite a lot of happy old people, <laughs> very old people, <laughs> They're just with their walkers, uh, just walking with centimeters, I can say, but they're into life. And I came to realize that I want to get old, but I want to be living my life. I want to enjoy the journey. This is something, the greatest shifts I have had here. What about social culture, getting along with British people compared to the uh -huh. cultures that you've been uh, accustomed to? It is, it is valid for when I moved to UK or Azerbaijan or uh, when I was in UAE. The most important thing is you should, I wanted to contribute to the community. I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to see what people are, where people are going around. For example, I was going to the community center in where I'm settled here uh, and joining the um, creative writing classes, for example. In Azerbaijan, I have uh, worked with nonprofit organization. And when people see you part of their life and you are contributing them, they hug you. They take you in part of their community. They don't consider you as someone who is coming from Turkey, but you are a Stains, for example, I'm living in a town like called Stains. You are a Stains citizen. You are part of their life. And mostly what I hear from people, oh, I. I feel that I have known you for long years. <laughs> Just giving and contributing to the community. Interesting. You, you mentioned stakeholders and how important the role of stakeholders. And I believe uh, with your uh, coaching method, you do involve stakeholders in helping your clients grow. Can you describe to us your, your process and why it works? Mm -hmm. uh, leaders are... Uh, assessed as great leaders by the person by how much they are perceived as being progressed i mean even though you can have quite a lot of trainings educations or whatsoever as long as your stakeholders who are working with you who are benefiting from your work as long as they perceive you perceive you as a progressed leader you are a great leader. The, the way how Marshall Goldsmith process is working on, uh, the most important thing is to change their behavior and make it like a habit so that it is sustained for a longer time. Therefore, uh, the coachee, we are intensely working with the stakeholders. That's, that's why it's called stakeholder centered co coaching. The coachee is approaching the, his or her stakeholders. First, we are getting their uh, view about which behaviors they would uh, suggest to change. 
or do better or maybe shift out of their uh, working style. And once the coachee decides which one or two behaviors he would like to change, he approaches the uh, stakeholders. These are the areas I would like to work for. What are your feed forwards for me to change in the future? What's a feed forward? Feed forward, uh, unlike feedback, is focusing on future. As we know, feedback is what you have performed. Feed forward is something that will help you to be better, a greater leader. And when you are involving the stakeholders, firstly, you are taking their commitment as well in this process. They are generally very happy to help you progress and be a better leader to work with together as a counterparty. Uh, secondly, they are your accountability partners rather than a coach. And with this feed forward, the uh, leader works throughout the month to change what behaviors uh, would be helping to be a better leader. In this process as a coach, I'm helping him to, to try new uh, strategies or let's say new behaviors uh, in the working environment. And he's the coachee, the leader, approach the stakeholders once a month to check in. How did I perform? Did you notice my progress? How was, how was I doing? And what should I do next month? Should I go continue? Should I stop any of the uh, behaviors I did? Or should I add anything else? So every month, the stakeholder, uh, the leader approaches the stakeholders and quarterly, and a survey is sent to these stakeholders by me, a uh, very short survey to assess how the leader has performed in the past three quarter, uh, past three months within the quarter. And this is a repeated process at least two or three times, three quarters, until the behavioral change becomes like a habit, becomes sustained. So that's the essence of the Marshall Goldsmith stakeholder-centered coaching process. Why is that different? Why is, why is that important to to involve stakeholders and why is it different than perhaps other executive coaching? Because executive coaching is not new as, as you know, and everybody's got different methodologies and everything. Um, I was reading a little bit about Marshall Goldsmith and it's very interesting how he even said that he won't, he doesn't mind not getting paid until he get results, you know? So obviously this is a very, yes. uh, a, a process he's very confident in and I'm sure you are as well as his certified coach. Why does that work? And why is that different from other methods that we've seen before? The process is focusing on the habit of the change so that the new behavior is ingrained into the DNA of the leader. With the, le with the trainings or standard coaching session, you just give some information. The leader sometimes tries and uh, just goes ahead. And the next month, he just forgets. And also, uh, you are focusing on what to change. You are not focusing on different things at each month and the, stake, uh, the stakeholders know what to observe in that leader rather than finding something that is that he's lacking or he has just forget, forget about. And the product is what the um, perceived progress is made by the stakeholders. Stakeholders are the people who are assessing the leader has changed or not. Otherwise, it's going to be just a self-assessment from the, in the standard coaching process. You just make a uh, assessment, self-assessment by the leader. How do you see yourself from zero to 10? Uh, I feel five. And after some trainings and coaching, he's gained some confidence. And you just ask him at the end of six months or one year, how do you feel? Oh, I feel, so I have, I know a lot of things. I'm sure I have done this. I'm just nine out of 10. But when you ask the team, especially, or the other leaders, oh, he has been having these uh, coaching sessions for months, but we didn't see any results. And no one asked us. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, in this methodology. That's true, isn't it? Because most coaching sessions, because the only reason I'm, I don't mean to sound negative, but there are a lot of coaches out there. 
And I think uh, executive coaching is, uh, is not exactly something new. It's interesting that actually, if I think back of my 11 years uh, in corporate, it doesn't matter what I think about myself. What matters is what other people think of me, right? I may think that I've changed, but if other people don't see it, I still don't get a good evaluation and I still don't it, it get is. my goals. So just like trying to influence them or something. So stakeholder centered coaching is interesting for me l listening to you because it actually makes a stakeholder take ownership over the leader's change as well. If you want her to change, well, you've got to help her, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and it's about, feed forward, not feedback, like I said, because I think, like you said, because I think it's a, I, uh, sometimes when people, you know, um, when I'm coaching uh, executives also, a lot of HR say these people get defensive. And I think a lot of defensiveness comes because you're, you're always thinking about the past. You should have done in the past. But then when you're thinking forward, there's really nothing to be defensive about. Would mm -hmm, you agree uh -huh. with that? Yeah, it's, it's all about the, the past is something. Okay, if you are dealing with a process, if you're an engineer or a quality manager or an operational risk professional in a bank, okay, you have to work on what is the root cause, whatever. But it's a person, it's a behavior, and it's an interaction that a leader has with a stakeholder. So you have to work on the, for the future. And when you get the contribution of the other people who are affected by the progress of the leader, the process creates quite uh, interesting and very valuable results. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's really nice having you on the show. It's just, uh, so you want to focus on foreign talent, foreign women, you know, assimilating themselves to the UK. Part of the, uh, the mission you have is to also help them change their behavior and get ahead in their career. What, what is your hope for this women, the, your target market? What is your vision for them? Enjoying the journey of their corporate life. Uh, recently, while I was uh, speaking to my coaches in this coronavirus uh, environment, some of them are working from home and some of them, the, there is not so much workload like in the legal department or else. And they say that we came to realize that the work was giving us energy. They came to realize the value of their work in the office. And what is important for me to let them enjoy while they are working in the office and find out what the joy they are taking from, the, uh, from their corporate jobs. And not to reflect in, into their family or not to reflect them as a frustration on themselves. I'm not able to do this or do that. So moral of the story, to enjoy the journey of their corporate lives. It's a, maybe a woo-woo <laughs> for the executive no, coaching. <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't enjoy the journey. They just do it for a job or, or they just do it because they have to. And I think bringing back, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on mental wellness, mental health. And I think part of that is to bring back the joy of work. You know, people, um, mm -hmm. joy of life, but the joy of work, because work is very much a part of life and how to balance that as well with having a family. Yeah. If you can give one or two tips for working women executives who want to get ahead and who are facing the challenge of assimil assimilating themselves to the mm -hmm. UK, what are one or two <clears throat> tips that you can give them now? Firstly, invest in themselves. If anything is insufficient, like language, like public speaking, like uh, technical knowledge they, they are lacking in their new role, invest in yourself. Go to a professional for your professional English or go to, uh, uh, there are quite a lot of paid communities uh, for public speaking or uh, whatever you need for your uh, leadership development. One of the I, uh, mistakes, let's say, <laughs> I did in my corporate life to recruit my own coach uh, rather than waiting for the company to assign a coach for me. This was something I should have done earlier. Oh, okay. So the mistake was because you did it 
uh, later instead of earlier. Yes, indeed. Okay. Not the mistake was because you picked it yourself. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you need someone to facilitate you get insights, uh, someone to act like a sounding board for you, and someone uh, act like an accountability partner that you can accomplish more uh, with your potential. And thirdly, but prioritize firstly yourself. Then when you are happy, uh, the life will be happy around. Interesting. I think uh, as a woman myself, I realized that uh, sometimes um, we prioritize other people, uh, whether it be family or work or, or the community more than we prioritize ourselves. And I think what you just said is you, I was expecting you to say prioritize your family. And then you said, no, prioritize yourself, which is excellent. You know, I think that's, that's really good because balance of life starts with how you feel balanced yourself. Yeah. That's good. Indeed. Indeed. Um, <laughs> at the end of my show, I always like to um, ask these random three questions because uh, I have fun learning from them, from your answers, actually. So if I can, I'll just ask you three quick questions. Um, Janan, what is the purpose of your life? Uh, enjoying the journey. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> enjoying the journey. If you can enjoy if you can change one thing about your life, the past or the future, what, what would it be? Uh, waiting for the perfect moment to act. Okay, so what when, you, when you decide to do something, don't try to figure out when should I be doing it, what would be the best time to do it. Just go for it. Just go for it. Good. Okay. Uh -huh. And how do you want to be remembered? um the, the joy of life okay yeah yeah <laughs> the lady with a successful you know a successful family and a successful joy of life wow yeah yeah it's it's a ripple effect when i radiate this joy of life people will be getting it i hear this from quite a lot of my friends i say we are watching you and how we are admiring you admiring is something really good word I would like I would have always heard because admiring is not jealousy admiring um, initiates you a fever inside I can do something also for myself so that's important the radiation of joy of life well definitely I think we've worked together for a few sessions and I think uh, what I do get out of you, your strength as a coach and a, and a guide for people is that you have a very authentic, positive side about you. You always see things, no matter how I challenge you, how, whatever, you just see things so positively. And uh, there's always a smile on your face. And you're telling me that you're active in the community with, you know, old people, young people, anything. It's just that, I think I told you once, you just have a lot of positivity and and it's almost like you're a great role model for people who just want to enjoy life. And oh. no you've, you've gone through your struggles, but it's just, you're beaming with positivity, which is actually quite <laughs> contagious. I'd rather you be contagious than all this virus stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, during this uh, virus stuff, I just consider it's not the first time that is happening in my life. And it's not the first time that each other people also experienced this before, not, not about the virus. You know, in Turkey, there was the social unrest, the political fights on the streets, and we were locked in, in the houses. Yep, I remember. And <laughs> if you went outside, you could have been shot. Yeah. There is no risk like this. You just cover your face and that's it. And it's not endless, it will end. And this is a storm, like, and in Turkey we had the earthquake, and we were, we were supposed to go to the office, and my husband was in the fund management industry. He has to the the financial markets were working, because people need this. You have to go there, or any other times you can guess. And you have also shared in your LinkedIn quite a lot of experiences, very similar times. 
the people whom I working there from ex-Soviet Union countries, they sh in the 1990s, they shifted from a communist regime to a liberal regime and things has changed and upside down in very short periods of time. Uh, Yesterday I have spoken to another coach who had, she is Austrian, but she has lived in Ethiopia, in Jamaica, and it was really easy for these countries to just lock down and take the measures very quickly. <laughs> so if we have these skills, uh, like vaccination, <laughs> that is strengthening our resilience power. Yeah, yeah. But that's, this is something that creates me the positive, uh, way of view for, for the life yeah sometimes i call it the gift of chaos right i mean living in a developing country indeed, we have the gift of chaos and it's uh it does it, it's not uh, what we're facing is not light i don't suggest we take it lightly but it's we also know that at least i do that nothing is permanent all this will pass and all this some somehow there's new rebirth and the cycle of economy will go back again uh like yeah we had political unrest we had massacres we had everything like that but somehow some way everything passes as well um yeah i, I can definitely see and i think what's important in working with a coach in my view because i work with coaches uh, i have coaches coaching me as well is that uh the coach also comes from that positive uh you know she can be a role model for me not just she can tell me the right thing to do by the book mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I, I definitely sense that about you and i think you you can be a great role model for a lot of professional women out there um and i'm really grateful that you can be on the show with us i hope you had fun <laughs> yeah really <laughs> it was nice <laughs> thank you yeah. i really enjoyed and uh, i missed our conversation to our next session <laughs> yeah exactly and thank you for for doing what you do um for the executive women and i look forward to hearing more about your content and seeing more about that and seeing what you succeed so all the best in your endeavors janan and thank, thank you thank you